Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. What's good, Alaska? This is Scott Levesque, and you're listening to the midweek edition of the Must Read Alaska podcast. I'd like to welcome everybody, and hey, just take a moment and give this podcast a five-star review. It really helps when people are searching for key terms like Alaska or politics. It helps bring this podcast to the top. And if you want to take just an extra step, go ahead and give us a written review. We love hearing from our listeners. The reviews we've got so far have been incredible, and we really appreciate all of our support for this podcast. And again, if you'd like to support Must Read Alaska in additional content like podcasting and videos and so forth, you could do so by going to mustreadalaska.com. And at the top right, there's a donate button. You can go ahead and donate there. We appreciate all our supporters, our readers, and our listeners. We can do this because of you guys, so thank you so much. Well, we have a lot going on. There's a ton of stuff, and today I don't want to call this the Forrest Dunbar edition, but we're going to unpack two pretty big stories that we're looking at for Forrest right now. But before we do that, let's talk about a couple things that have been uh, recently come up over the last week or so. Uh, The first I want to touch on is a candidate debate for the 2021 mayoral election here in Anchorage, and it really uh, pits three candidates to have a discussion um, on February 24th, and the doors are going to open at 5.30, and it's at the Mate Event Catering, and that's on, I believe, East 76th Ave. I believe that's where it is. Anyways, it's starting, I believe, around 6 o'clock. Doors open at 5.30, and the candidates that are going to be there are going to be um, Mike Robbins, Bill Evans, and Dave Bronson, and they're going to... St- Essentially, your centrist to left, or excuse me, your centrist to right uh, leaning candidates are going to be sitting down and having a discussion about some of the main issues that are facing our municipality uh, in the coming year and then years beyond there during their term if they get elected. And so this is going to be a great debate. I think this is extremely important. The, the event was sold out literally just moments after putting tickets on sale. So obviously, there's a lot of interest in in hearing these candidates talk. And quite frankly, I that doesn't surprise me with the fact that the last few years now have been uh, a real uh, indictment on the left-leaning policies here in the municipality. I think people are ready for a change, and I think people are ready to look at a a different type of candidate, a candidate maybe that hasn't been in office here in this municipality for a while. And I don't think it's just going to stop at the mayoral candidate uh, portion. I think this is going to trickle down, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, uh, I think it's really important. Listen, if you haven't had the opportunity to um, mark this on your calendar, do so. This is something you're not going to want to miss. Listen, these are the these are three leading candidates right now outside of anybody on the left that are are real shots at winning this election. I mean, real shots. You have Mike Robbins, who's been a local business owner, um, guy who who has connections within the business world. You've got Dave Bronson, who's who's really picked up steam. He's ex military, um, really for. Uh, the business owner as well, but also has really shown his face during the summertime in 2020 when there was a lot of protests and um, and gatherings outside the Lusac Library in response to not only just the the pandemic response or policies, but also in response to some ordinances that were being passed. And then there's Bill Evans, and Bill Evans has a has a track record here in Anchorage. He's the most centrist candidate that's probably going to be on the ballot. And, and quite frankly, he's the one that um, could garner that that purple, you know, I have some I have some left leanings, right leanings, but I don't really consider myself one or the other. He, he sits right smack dab in the middle. So this is going to be a great debate. This is going to be a great discussion. And my hope is, is that this is really about the issues. At the end of the day, I'm not I'm not interested or concerned about backbiting and fighting and you know jabs and all that i i want to know and i think the people want to know exactly where the each candidate stands on really critical policy issues and of course the number one policy issue that's going to be out there is what's going to happen if they have emergency powers 
What is their emergency orders going to be? Uh, where do they see themselves uh, fitting in the terms of this pandemic um, policy making? And, and how are they going to work with a current assembly that is very left leaning, that has the majority of individuals on that? that assembly do not see eye to eye with most of these candidates. I would say Bill Evans has maybe a little bit of a shot to working best with them, but there's going to be conflict there. And it'll be interesting to hear how each one of these candidates is going to work with the assembly to get legislation and policy uh, passed and, and ready to go. Because at the end of the day, it's lining up right now that the assembly is setting itself up that after the election takes place they're going to vote on the extension of the emergency of declaration keep in mind they want you to believe this but it's not true the assembly votes on the extension of emergency declaration they do not vote on emergency powers however an extension in, in the declaration of an emergency automatically extends the ability for the mayor to have emergency powers so they go hand in hand. As much as they want to tell you that it's not lock and step, it is. So this is it, it, the assembly is is sort of hedging its bets. So if if a candidate that's very left leaning, Forrest or even Falsy gets in, uh, you pr probably can can rest assured that there's going to be another extension to the declaration of emergency. Now, if Bronson or Robbins gets in you can guarantee that that's going to be taken off the table. And Bill Evans, I'm not really sure. I think it depends on what goes on behind closed doors, if you know what I'm saying. But regardless, this is going to be an incredible debate. I'm really excited about this. If you uh, if you were one of the lucky ones to get a ticket, hey, this is going to be exciting. If you did not get a ticket, I believe they're going to live stream this as well. So I, I will... Uh, I will keep you guys, uh, Must Read Alaska will keep you guys informed about, you know, the live stream feed and all that. But this is a debate you want to hear. And like I told you before, this is going to be important because I think, I think, based on what I'm seeing, many residents of the municipality are done with left-leaning policy and politics and candidates. It looks like there's a lot of push towards more conservative or, dare I say, Republican viewpoints when it comes to a lot of policies, because they've seen the the damage that's been done uh, just in the last year with with these policies and, and the idea of just crippling specific industries based on on what really nobody really knows. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting debate. Now, like I said before, this is also going to have a trickle down effect. I think, however the 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 actual election goes is going to trickle down into the assembly and what i mean by that is if bronson or even evans or, or robbins gets uh through and elected i think that is going to be probably the beginning of the end to many of the left leaning assembly members i think all you have to do if you're a candidate moving forward is prove and show that your track record is one of conservative and or more right-leaning policy making and I think you have a good chance of getting in to, uh, into the assembly. Now, I'm not guaranteeing anything by any means, but come on. We've just seen this. I mean, we've seen the backlash of the assembly. We've seen what's happened over the last year through 2020 into 2021 already. We've seen the kind of stuff that's been happening at the Lusack Library, at the chambers, outside. It's, it's evident. I mean, if you can't read the writing on the wall, then I'm not sure where your head is. But it's definitely not out in the air. It's in the sand. There's no reason why, moving forward, that we should continue to allow this type of policy making to continue. Anchorage is no longer thriving. It is actually looks like it's receding back and back and back. And not only that, but taxes are increasing, increasing, increasing. Why? Because you're not going to get the business revenue anymore. You're not going to get a lot of the revenue that the, the municipality would get because they essentially killed a, a really important industry in this community they have they have and so now what are you faced with you've got to increase property private property tax you've got to increase other taxes alcohol tax so forth and so on to make up that revenue because god forbid you'd cut anything so with that being said i just think this is going to be an extremely uh productive conversation and like i said my goal my goal, if I'm the moderator, is I don't want backbiting or fighting. What I want is true policy 
uh, debriefing. I want to know what your policy is on really key specific topics, uh, particularly that are going to be essential the moment you step foot into office. Uh, Moving on from there, let's talk about the governor transitioning to what he calls a path to normalcy with no more mandating mandatory airport testing. So on Sunday, uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy sort of issued um, a statement saying that there will be no additional emergency orders. Uh, and again, he left the caveat, at least not right now, which is which is a big deal. And, I, and I'll tell you why here in a second. But uh, the state is is noticing and seeing, and I'm I'm assuming Governor Dunleavy is is doing this in uh, in tandem with some of the advisors he's been using uh, in the past to uh, whether to decide to continue emergency orders. But this is a big turning point in our state. We uh, we are no longer, at least at the moment, going to be issuing any more emergency orders, which is huge. Again, I'm I'm assuming the people that he's been consulting with uh, are providing this information and could you know encouraging him to do this. Now, with that being said, this obvious obviously has a ripple effect in a lot of the communities in the bur- in the boroughs <clears throat> and also in the municipalities that are here in Alaska. So the question is this, from the beginning, the municipality of Anchorage specifically has said they've been in lockstep with the state on these emergency orders. And that has been a, a, a key messaging point for both the administration, old and current acting, as well as the assembly, that being in lockstep with the state on their emergency orders was fundamental in continuing the declaration of emergency. So the question now is, with the state actually saying we will no longer issue any more emergency orders as of now, will that have an impact in April when there's the vote again to extend the declaration of emergency? And I would have to say, again, in the perfect world with what they've been saying and what they've been saying um, for the last couple of months in regards to why they have extended, as a key messaging point, they would not extend in that situation. However, I think that has nothing to do with what's going to happen in April. I think anything that happens in April is going to be a direct reflection of one thing and one thing only, and that is who wins the Anchorage mayor election. That is going to determine whether or not they extend emergency powers or, or, sorry, extend the declaration of emergency. Keep in mind, keep in mind, they've been saying for months, almost a year now, that one of the biggest reasons to extend is because the state has, because the governor has. Now that the governor is saying he's no longer going to do that, at least in the current situation, will the municipality here in Anchorage also follow lock and step? And and again, I've never really thought that the extension of the emergency declaration was anything to do with the state. I, I'm sure at some level it was, but really this is politics. And let's just keep that in mind. It's politics. It's about who has power and who can make decisions, which is why I think in April when this vote is is up again um, for an extension, if, if you have Robbins or you have um, Bronson or even even possibly Evans, they're pulling it off the table. Now, if, if it's Forrest or Falsey, which it could be, they're going to keep it on the table because power is important in politics. So just just sort of remember that. Um, listen, there's three new health advisories. Um, you know, advisory one is to, quote, keep Alaskans safe and addresses the safety measures that Alaskans could take to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. There's health advisory two, which is international and interstate travel. Uh, health advisory number three is interstate travel. And then the health advisory four is like critical infrastructure kind of stuff. But but really, this is a big turning point here in Alaska. And so the, the question is, is will communities in Alaska that have their own specific restrictions or emergency orders in place, will they follow suit with the state? That will, that will be interesting. But uh, as of right now, it expired February 14th at midnight. So there is no emergency order for the state of Alaska. There, there says none. So let's move on. And, and like I said, this is going to be sort of the uh, 
unintentionally, the Forrest Dunbar episode. Well, Musri Nodaska did a bit of a deep dive on a lot of the APOC filings here recently. And, and one of those was obviously Forrest Dunbar. He filed uh, ahead of the deadline. And so we were able to get a glimpse and a little bit of a picture of exactly who is supporting Forrest. And, and there are some really interesting um, just generalities. One is that Forrest is, well, I guess for lack of a better term, funded by some high-profile people. Some high-profile people have been contributing to his campaign, and we'll go over a couple of those individuals. Another thing to note is the amount of -of out-of-state funding he has received. Uh, That's a second portion we'll go over here in a minute. And third is comparing his fundraising efforts to Berkowitz back in 2018 and and comparing and contrasting some of those differences in there. So let's, let's start with number one. And number one is this. We're going to look at just a couple of the people that have been funding Forrest through his campaign thus far. One of the one of the biggest funders and one of the most high profile funders and high dollar um, donation um, pieces that he's got from is Jamie Raskin. Now you may have heard of that name. Jamie Raskin is a congressman from Maryland. Uh, he was the attorney who was the House of Representatives impeachment manager. And he was the lead prosecutor for the Donald Trump trial in the U.S. Senate earlier this month. So that's probably where you've heard that name. Now, Jamie has been uh, donating to Forrest as well as Lori Hummel, who is uh, probably donated at least three times, I believe, since uh, March of 2020. I think she donated in March, in December, and then uh, recently in January here. So she has been donating to uh, Forrest Campaign in the recent months. <clears throat> and she is, uh, well, she was, I should say, a part of the Walker administration. She was the former adjunct general of Alaska under Bill Walker. Um, she's also a uh, general Inspector General of the National Guard, uh, which is where you know Forrest is a a JAG officer in the Guard as well. And the reason this is interesting is that these are just some whole, like very high profile people that are donating right now to to the Dunbar campaign, which is really interesting. Uh, particularly the one with Hummel because of her her, for lack of a better term, her influence and her power within the National Guard itself. Um, She's high profile up the chain of command in the National Guard. So just some interesting components to this. And and why the, that particular one is really interesting is because also in Montreal, Alaska, Craig Campbell writes, uh, who's a contributor there, wrote, wrote an open letter to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. And it was really concerning Forrest Dunbar, and particularly some of the tweets and some of his political ideology, including rhetoric in regards to the Constitution, uh, in regards to the... Um, the things that were going on in Portland last year, particularly some of the demonstrations and uh, which quickly turned into rioting and so forth. So Forrest has has sort of a history of of perpetuating some of these left wing messaging, for lack of a better term. And uh, Craig writes an open letter to the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin about this, just in general, about some of the things that are going on in the National Guard. Right now, I, I would recommend you read it. Again, the, the headline at Must Read Alaska is Craig Campbell's open letter to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin concerning Forrest Dunbar. But he really kind of, he touches on a, a article in the National Guard Association magazine and then moves into uh, Dunbar himself. But this is really interesting. Forrest is sort of coming up now and bubbling up. You know, you had the letters or the emails between him and Christopher Constant come out recently as well and some of the things that they were doing which seemed like it was not on the up and up right so those things were coming out and then now with some of the campaign financing um filings there at apoc and seeing some of the people that are really pouring into forrest's campaign it forrest is just putting himself into this situation now again there's a lot of questions to be had but the two biggest people that we, that have really popped out on this um, APOC report has been Jamie Raskins, like I said, which is the congressman who is the lead prosecutor uh, in the Donald Trump trial here this early this month. And then, of course, Lori Hummel, which we just talked about, the uh, inspector general of the National Guard. But what's also interesting about these filings is just how many donations have come to Forrest's campaign 
outside of Alaska. You know, after Must Read Alaska kind of did its research, it shows about 21% of Forrest's donations have come out of state, which is very interesting. Very interesting. And as we, we get to that third component of what we're talking about, with which is the comparison to Berkowitz's campaign in 2018, this is a big jump in out-of-state donations, particularly for a lead Democratic candidate. Now, why is that interesting? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one is obviously is forced with some of these high profile um, donations coming from Jamie Raskins, for example. It, are there others that are following suit with Raskins in, in donating to Forrest campaign? Why are they interested in a, in a mayor race here in Alaska? And what does that really mean? So part of this is speculation on my part. But what it t- tells me is, is that there is some concern um, from the Democratic Party nationally. That for some reason, we've, we've piqued their interest, probably because the, you know, the mayor of Anchorage has a lot of power in the state, just in population and, and revenue and all of that. I mean, the spending, it's just a very powerful position in a state that does not have a lot of big cities. So there's there's interest there, which means also in my mind, if you're if you're getting these outside donations, and when we juxtapose this again to the 2018 campaign of of Berkowitz, it shows that perhaps the Democrats aren't as um, satisfied with the nominees, the the sorry, the candidates that are running. So there might be some push to get some outside money in to help with the campaign. The other thing is, is that it's just generally speaking very strange to have that much money coming from out of state for a, a campaign of of this local size. It just doesn't make any sense at all, really. I mean, I'm trying to push in some some possible reasons as to why, but 21% of your campaign's funds right now are from out of state donors is is a concerning number if I'm an Alaskan resident, regardless of political affiliation. Because the reality is, is that we are all beholden to those people that give us money at some level. So it, it really is a bit concerning that 21% of currently, right now, as constituted, 21% of his donations are from out of state. Now, you can try to break that up. And, and again, we could break that up into people who are snowbirds and, and all that, which may be the case. It may be the case. But still, even if you're a snowbird, that doesn't that means that you're you're spending half of your time out of the municipality. Okay, you're spending half your time out, maybe a little bit less. But if you're a snowbird, you're leaving about October and you're not coming back till April, May. So, again, it's it's about your constituents. It's about the municipality getting a mayor that's able to vouch for the people that are here year round. And so it's just very interesting. I thought that number was really high. And here's why it's high. The third component to this is really interesting because when you juxtapose what we just talked about to Forrest and some of the high profile people, particularly out of state, high profile people like Congressman um, Raskins, when you look at the Berkowitz campaign in 2018, there's some very interesting things. Number one is Berkowitz raised over $600,000 right now. And again, when, when this article was written. Forrest has raised over $252,000, a stark contrast to Berkowitz back in 2018. Not only that, but 89, almost 90% of monies raised for that campaign by Berkowitz was within the municipality. So let's just, let's just put this in perspective. Forrest says 21% of his funds right now that are coming from out of state Berkowitz had 6%. That's incredible. That is incredible. So again, there's a lot of speculation as to why that is. I mean, if you look at it, 2018 to 2021, I mean, how, how many of those could be different when it comes to, let's say, like I talked about before, could possibly the out of state donations come from snowbirds? Maybe, but why wouldn't Berkowitz have that same appeal? So does that diminish the fact that maybe that out of that 21%, only 6% of them are snowbirds or less? And when I say snowbirds, I mean Alaskans that reside somewhere else during the winter months. It just doesn't make sense. It's not adding up. Not to mention that, I mean, Dunbar has not raised nearly the amount 
He's raised about 42% of what Berkowitz did when Berkowitz ran for re-election in 2018. But he's got about 230% higher out-of-state donations than Berkowitz did. It just doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. And that, to me, is where a lot of this concerning out-of-state money comes into play is because you have such such a distinction in out-of-state money donations when in three to four years, it, I mean, we're not talking about a major difference in possible uh, Alaskans who spend half of their year somewhere else. This money is coming from out of state by by bigger donors and many people who probably don't reside. I don't know the intentional or the actual numbers by that by that measure, so I can't officially say this. But it just feels that right now. And in, until we dive a little bit deeper, I won't know those numbers. But again, when you go from Berkowitz in 2018 having about six percent of his donations being out of state to now Dunbar has 21 percent. And we don't even know what that number will be at the end. 6% was after all the donations were accounted for and filed through APOC in the Berkowitz uh, campaign. Will that number go down for Forrest Dunbar? Maybe. That could possibly be true. But I don't know yet. And God forbid that goes up. That's not a good sign. Because here's, again, it boils down to this. Allegiance comes to money. Priority comes to money. Now, I'm not saying that Democrat, Republican, always go with their constituents. We'd like to think in a perfect world that actually happens. But the reality is this. The reality is, is a lot of candidates are beholden to where their money comes from, to the people where their money comes from. And if candidates are getting their money from the people within the municipality, great. If the majority of their funds are coming from there, great. But with 21%, that's a high number. I mean, that's really high. So I'll be interested to see as as the Dunbar campaign gets through and, and more filings come in, what that percentage actually ends up being. What's the final number there? And more importantly than that, digging out where exactly those funds are coming from. Are they for snowbird Alaskans or are they really from people out of state that are just chipping in? It's important that we just realize the amount of money that is being collected in the Dunbar campaign is going to be interesting to see moving forward where that leads to. I just think it will be very interesting to see. And uh, and as we continue to look at some of the APOC filings from, from all of the candidates, it'll be very, very curious to see how this ends up. Because if there's one thing I know about what's happened over the last years, particularly in, in the municipality, is that residents and people within the municipality that have businesses are fed up with not being heard and also feeling like their representatives are not representing them. So in this time, I think a call of unity and and hearing from the people is going to be important. So we'll see how this plays out moving forward. But hey, that's it for me today. I appreciate everybody who's been listening. We love you. We love our listeners. We love our readers. And we love our supporters. And we just can't do this without you here at Must Read Alaska. I'm privileged to work with Suzanne Downing and John Quick. It's been really great being a part of this team. And if you haven't, check us out on Facebook. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on Rumble, check us out on Me MeWe, uh, Parlor's back up. Uh, we're on all major social sites, and it's all under Must Read Alaska, all one word. So check us out there. Give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, all the above, because we're putting out content on a regular basis. And uh, we do this so that you get a full, rounded view of the news, not just a particular narrative. Well, again, that's it for me this week. We'll see you next week. And until then, stay classy.